you have your Bibles this morning, you're welcome to join me and turn to the book of Mark, chapter 8. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. Maybe you want to just lean to your left or right, and somebody might be willing just to share with you. If not, just listen. It's all right. I'm reading out of the book of Mark, chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. The message that's titled this morning is, The End is the Beginning. I spent some time just looking at this, and it's really just a marvel of how gracious and loving Jesus Christ is when we don't get it, but yet his desire to continue to call us unto himself. And here's a moment in scripture where Jesus makes it very clear, I'm going to suffer. I must suffer, is what he tells the disciples which means it's necessary. My very reason for being here, the very reason why I came down on this earth, I've got to suffer. It is a divine necessity in order for Jesus Christ to suffer for our sakes so that we could be restored back unto the Father. Jesus tells them directly and plainly, I must suffer. And then he goes on to say, I must be rejected. Rejected by the priests, the Sadducees. Rejected by those who are not of the church and rejected by those who are of the church. I must suffer. I will be rejected. Then he says, I'm going to be killed. And then I'm going to rise again on the third day. And scripture says that he says this plainly. And it's really in this mid portion of the book of Mark, it's actually the first of three times that he says this to his disciples, a word still for you and I today, that this would be an a full grasp and understanding for you and I, that this is the gospel right here. And it, he says it out of his own mouth. I mean, could you imagine after traveling with Jesus Christ, watching him heal the sick, open blind eyes, seeing the dead raised, and then he just takes a moment and goes, I'm, I must suffer. I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise again on the third day. And he says that plainly. And the root of that word plainly in Scripture actually means that he said it with, with boldness and with courage. He said it with confidence. He wasn't melodramatic. He didn't say it in such a way that you had to figure out the clues he didn't say it in such a way where he was just afraid or, or, or overwhelmed, but he said it in all confidence and boldness. You see, it was the joy of Jesus Christ to do what his father wanted him to do so that we could be restored. It was with joy and confidence that he would say, I'm going to suffer. There, there was no backing away from this amazing purpose and call of Jesus Christ. And it didn't make sense to the disciples. That's, you know, at this time, you know, which is the persecution that was coming from the Romans. Here, these disciples, here the Jews just, they wanted, a, they wanted a king right then and there. Not a Messiah who would suffer. It wasn't attractive. 
It wasn't something to get all excited about and, and get your praise on and get your worship on. To hear our king say, I'm going to suffer and, and, and be persecuted and, and die and, and rise again on the third day. In, in the natural, that wasn't a really good speech for him to be king over the people. Didn't sound very good. And even still today, a suffering Messiah is not as attractive as one that flaunts some sort of grandeur or status or, or style. Even today, there are people that, in the name of Jesus, simply show off or it's all about dressing well or it's all about looking good or it's all about my status or it's all about my likes or it's... It's all about me going viral on social media. And depending on what his social media status looks like depends on whether you've got real followers and whether you've got a real message to share. So Jesus right now, what he was saying to these disciples and to the crowd that was around, that wasn't something that would really go viral. It wasn't something that was going to boost his following on Facebook. Didn't look good. Status didn't look good with, some, with conversation like this. And so one young man decides to pull him aside, Peter. And scripture says, says that he, he pulled him aside, which most likely here he is, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, our, our Savior, who basically lays out the plan to save you and I. Peter grabs his hands and says, no, 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 come on, come here, come here, come here. And scripture says he pulls him aside from from the crowd, and he rebukes Jesus, which, which means he, he attempts to put Jesus in his place. He calls him out on what he thinks is, is bad theology. Hey, can you imagine this moment? After in all confidence and courage that Jesus shares what's going to happen, and Peter pulls him aside and says, you can't say that. That's, that's not a part of the plan, Jesus. You know, it, it, it's, it's all, it, it doesn't look good or just for, for all of us. The, the idea of suffering, the idea of you being rejected, you know, you're, you're supposed to be king. You were supposed to restore the kingdom to Israel. And besides, you know, we're following you and our status is supposed to look a little better now that we're following you. And it's amazing how if Jesus doesn't say or look like what we want him to say or look like, we'll rebuke him in our minds. If, if he's not fulfilling what I want for me, myself, we'll, we'll put Jesus in check in our prayers. And Jesus his response in authority, you know, his power, and in love. He rebukes Peter. And he says something. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, it's not that Satan was in Peter, but it was a moment in Scripture in this story where Satan was attempting, attempting to tempt Peter and tempt Jesus to go in another direction, to break away from the perfect plan that came from the Father to save you and I. And so he says, get thee behind me, Satan, which means get out of here, because my Father's plan is not changing. Amen. I love this. My Father's plan is not going to change. Get thee behind me, Satan, because the idea would be, hey, if, 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 if maybe just Jesus could just focus on just restoring the kingdom of Israel right there and, and, and removing all of the bondage and the poverty and then, you know, elevating Peter and the disciples and giving them status and position in the church. I mean, it's amazing how, you know, sometimes we'd rather have a temporal plan rather than an eternal plan. And that was Peter. And Jesus had to shut that down because Jesus is not just about the kingdom and what's going on in New York City. 
Jesus represents the kingdom of God. And his ways are higher than our ways. And what the kingdom of God has to offer will last a lot longer than a temporal fix right here. And so he says to Peter, Peter, listen, for you are not set, setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Let's set your mind on the things of God today. Not on the things of man, not on the things that are in the natural, but those things that are of the supernatural. God himself, the kingdom of God. Let that be where your mind is. I was reading in Romans chapter 8. It says in verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And so Jesus calls the crowd to him. He calls the crowd with his disciples. He calls the crowd. He calls you and I. See, I love this moment. See, in this conversation with, with Peter, as he attempted to rebuke Jesus, and Jesus rebukes him back. You can't out-rebuke Jesus. And Jesus has a moment where he looks at the disciples and he looks at the crowd. And this was such a tender moment because he realizes, I, I have to finish what I'm going to say, but I need to say it to everybody. Which really reflects that this word belongs to you and I. That not only would the disciples know in this moment, but that the crowd would know, that you and I would know, that would follow after. He said, if you, if you, if you come after me, if you follow me, if, you, if you're here, then I'm going to give you this word that calls you to be my disciple. I love this moment for me because it, it, it really intimates that Jesus Christ desires that we would not just simply be a crowd, but that each and every one of you here in the house of the Lord at Times Square Church and those of you watching online would be disciples of Jesus Christ. Not... Not, not just people that are just visiting or people that are just, just seeking. That's all fine or, or just passing through. But there's a greater call that Jesus really expresses here when he comes back over to the crowd that everyone would know. That I desire that you would just follow me and I want to give you a position. I want to give you a role. It's to be my disciple. It's not just to be an onlooker. It's not just to, just to stare and just and look. It's not just to have a, an ooh and ah moment. Oh, my goodness, look at this wonderful theater. Oh, my goodness. Uh, no. We're here. We're here to follow Jesus Christ. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If anyone would come after me, if you seek me, if you want me, if you're here today, if you're watching online, deny yourself. You've got to come to the end of self. The end of self-absorption, the end of self-focus, the end of me, I, and what I want. There has to come to a place of denial, which means that's it, I'm done. This is not self-hatred, that's not what I'm talking about. It is really a change in saying, I'm gonna focus my life on the divine will of God and not my self-will my lifestyle and my efforts in life and my pursuit of life and the very elements of life are focused on God's divine will for me. That's denying self. And he says, you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean? Take up his cross and follow me. Well, the cross 
up until Jesus showed up, was just an instrument of death. But when Jesus came and died on the cross, it represented life for you and I. But life for you and I, because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, is fully grasped and understood when we carry the cross, which represents the death of self, the denial of self. And that cross represents all of our mess that Jesus took on himself and died. You see, it all really just comes together. This is why if, if, if Peter could have grasped this, there would have never been that silly rebuke that Peter attempted to do. And this is why Jesus goes on in this moment to say, no, listen, I'm just saying, yes, I said to you, I'm going to suffer many things. Yes, I'm going to be rejected and killed, but I'm going to rise again on the third day. But I'm doing this for you because you got a whole lot of mess that's going to be nailed to me on the cross. And that stuff has got to die. And I'm doing a finished work so that you don't have to die. It's a finished work. Here's what's so awesome. It's really our cross. But Jesus took that cross and he died in our place. He's not saying that we have to die anymore because of his finished work 2,000 years ago. We just got to carry it. That's a big difference. All we got to do is carry it. And in carrying the cross, we identify with a suffering Messiah. See, the whole, the whole idea of carrying the cross in and, 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 and many churches today, it's not an attractive word. It's, it's not the message anybody wants to hear. We want to hear glory and <laughs> blessings and many more blessings and blessings. <laughs> we want to hear about a king. King, it was a t-shirt that came out sometime. Jesus is my homeboy, you know? I was like, oh, wow, really? No, he's, he's, he's way more than that. Yes, 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 he's a friend, but before you can understand the friendship that you have in Jesus Christ, you've got to understand the Messiah who suffered for you and I. It's important. Verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. You know what that means? It's, it means like you and I, we have that moment constantly of, of battling between self-will and the divine will of God. And, 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 and daily, there is, there's this war of just flesh and, and, and spirit, right? And you've got to understand something. That for you to attempt to fight that fight yourself, you will lose every time. Meaning this, you cannot be your own savior. You can't save yourself. There's nothing that you and I can do in my own strength to figure out how to have a successful life. I need Jesus Christ to save me. You and I are all desperately in need of a savior. Every time we attempt to figure it out on our own, outside of this, we will lose. Every time we try to save a situation outside of Jesus Christ, we lose. Every time I try to save my marriage, if you try to save your marriage outside of Jesus Christ, you'll lose. You try to save your job status outside of Jesus Christ, you'll lose. If you try to save your children outside of Jesus Christ, you will lose. Jesus Christ is the answer for it all. You can't save your own life. You, you can't undo what Jesus already did 2,000 years ago. He went to the cross. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake 
and the gospels will save it. You see, the end is the beginning. The end of self is the beginning of new life in Jesus Christ. The end of self-preservation, the end of self-focus, the end of self-absorption. The end. You bring that to its end. You pick up the cross and there's life in Jesus Christ. You'll find life in Jesus Christ. You'll find life. And Paul said it. He said, I, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives inside of me. Why does Paul say I've been crucified with Christ? Because this self has been crucified with Christ. Me, my selfishness, my pride, my sinful nature, my, my anger, my bitterness, self. He said, Paul's basically saying, who I really am went to that cross. But Jesus went to that cross as my substitute. So I was crucified with Christ. And this is why, no longer I that live, but Christ that lives inside of me. Because all of this now is now just simply the dwelling place of Jesus Christ and his spirit. And that's the beginning of life. You know, scripture, all through the gospels, gives us this wonderful picture uh, of a man named Simon of Cyrene. And Simon of Cyrene, he lived in, in a place of, of northern Libya, in, in North Africa is where Simon of Cyrene lived. And, and, and really, he was most likely a Jew, some think maybe, uh, maybe a Gentile, but, but either way, the, the, the point of Simon of Cyrene, and I love this story, and I, I, it really gives us the, 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 symbol, the symbolism of carrying the cross. Simon of Cyrene had, uh, had taken a trip from North Africa all the way to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And now I'm sure that's 900 some miles, so which it means it's, that's weeks of traveling. A lot of traveling. And he, he makes this journey because he, he was a devout man and he, he believed in religion. And Simon of Cyrene, you know, just he wanted to get to Jerusalem and get to the Passover feast. And it was something that he did on a regular basis, you know, probably once or twice a year. You know, maybe. Like some of us, we get to church a few times out the year <laughs> because we believe it's good to be religious, you know? I love when New Yorkers say that, you know, it's good to be religious. They, they, they say that really boldly, real proud, right? But something's about to happen with Simon the Cyrene. He takes this trip all the way to Jerusalem. I'm sure he's tired, he's wiped out. I'm sure he probably feels good about himself because he makes this pilgrimage on a regular basis. He's worked hard. He keeps his commitment. He's going to get to the Passover feast. Church is a good thing. He makes his, all the way, his, makes his way all the way into Jerusalem, and, and when he comes to the end of his journey, there is Christ. Some of us today, we're going to have to come to the end of our journey in order to really begin a new life in Christ Jesus. Simon of Cyrene shows up in Jerusalem. So he's wiped out and tired. Hours and hours, days and days of traveling. I'm sure he just wants to sit down. He wants to come in and just sit down and just rest. Read a few of the scriptures from the book of Isaiah and call it a day and have Passover feast. But Jesus is about to change his whole life. When he shows up, Scripture reveals to us it's absolute chaos, complete madness. And he gets to this, in the middle of this chaos, and there he is. And Scripture says that he was just a passerby, just passing on through. Like so many today, we got more people that are coming into churches now all over the world, and they just, they just want to pass on by, but they don't want to carry the cross. And he shows up, and it's absolute chaos. But in the midst of chaos, there's Jesus Christ. And it doesn't look like the sweet little Passover feast that he was hoping for. I'm sure he had plans to change his clothes, take a shower, look sharp. But what he didn't realize is things were about to get very dirty and very bloody. And yet he would be the closest ever to Jesus Christ than he's ever been. 
And there he is in this chaos and in this crowd. And the scripture tells us that he's, he's, he's a passerby, so he doesn't even know what's going on. And most likely, because he lived in North Africa, Simon and Cyrene, he doesn't even know who Jesus looks like. He knows what religion looks like, but he doesn't know what Jesus looks like. And all of a sudden, the Roman soldiers grab him. Scripture says he was compelled to get out onto the road. Because I'm going to tell you something, that we're in a time now so dark and so wicked that the very wickedness around you will compel you and force you into a position where you either have to carry the cross or run for your life. And so he's compelled and he's pushed out into the road. And now they tell him, you got to carry this cross. There goes religion now. It's going to take a lot more than just religion to do what they've asked you to do. Because they're going to want you to prove yourself. But hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he picks up the horizontal piece that Jesus was carrying. Because at this point, Jesus is just so tired, so weak. And here we have this picture of this man who doesn't fully grasp everything that's going on. But that's okay. Sometimes it won't make sense. But you just keep your eyes on Jesus. And they're, they're shouting and they're laughing and they're mocking over here. And women are crying over here. And people are just carrying on all different ways. And it's just an absolute mob and crazy scene. But he's told this all out of the words of those that are, that are wicked. The very Romans that have compelled him say, just follow him to Calvary. And so he's got this horizontal piece. He doesn't even really understand who the man is that he's, he's following behind. Jesus Christ, his face is, is so swollen and so bruised. It's the crown of thorns on his head, he's, he's unrecognizable. And sometimes in the midst of chaos and sometimes in your own suffering, you might feel like you can't recognize Jesus Christ. But oh, he's the Messiah who suffered. He's the Messiah who was rejected. That's who I'm going to follow. The Messiah who was killed. The Messiah who would rise again on the third day. That's who I'm going to follow with all of my life. It's just so overwhelming to the right and to the left. You ever been in situations where you just feel overwhelmed, you don't know what to do? Well, this is what you're going to do. You're going to carry the cross and you're going to follow Jesus. We're just going to follow Jesus. And here he is. This cross, this, this cross, I'm there, there it is. I'm, it's, all, it's, it's, it's all bloody. I mean, it's not even my blood. That's right. Hallelujah. It's not my blood that was shed on, on the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm just carrying it. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that makes us whole, that washes us clean. And he carries this place, this, this cross to the place, to a place called the skull, a place called Golgotha, where for up until then, it was always known as, as the end of life. But this would be the beginning of life. It was always known as a place of just shame. That you would die in your shame, you would die in your despair. But in this moment, we recognize that the end is the beginning of new life in Jesus Christ. Oh, glory to God. Simon of Cyrene, I believe he, I believe he was never the same again. Oh, what a picture to carry the cross of Jesus Christ. It's our cross. But he made it his. And Jesus Christ, he lays down his life for you and I. I want to go into this next year carrying the cross to fully embrace the Jesus that suffered many things was rejected was killed but he rose again on the third day Jesus who went to the cross on my behalf yours he died for you Oh, God, give us the strength to carry the cross. Sometimes it won't make sense. Sometimes it'll be just absolutely overwhelming. But you follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, who suffered for you. 
And you know what? You identify with Christ Jesus in a glorious way. It's freedom in Jesus Christ. As, as we carry the cross, it's such a wonderful call to be disciples, to be the ambassadors of Christ. If we choose to follow Christ and carry the cross, what it does is it deepens what you've been called to do as an ambassador, as a witness of Jesus Christ. I want the music ministry to come forward. We're going to worship the Lord, but I'm going to invite you to step out and pray with me up here. That as you go into this new year, as you, as you, as you're now wrapping up whatever you're wrapping up in this year, let it be one thing that you know for sure what you're going into. And that is that you're going to step out and carry the cross of Jesus Christ. You know what? This is not the time for casual Christians. I don't want to be just an onlooker on the side. I don't want to just be a passerby. I'm all in. I'm all in. And in this dark time, I'll carry the cross. I will recognize my Messiah as the one who suffered for me. And maybe some of you here, it's been casual for you. Or maybe even getting ready to go into the new year, you've decided, I'm just going to take it easy this year. This, this new year, I'm just, uh, I, just, I, I just don't need it. I don't need the stress. I, don't need, I just don't need to be bothered. I'm just going to lay low. I will never go to my grandmama's house again for Christmas. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm ready. Whatever challenge, whatever trial, whatever we must endure, whatever we must suffer with, I'm ready because Jesus Christ makes me victorious in this walk because of his finished work. I'm getting ready to ask you to stand up, but some of you, when you stand up, you know who you are. Some of you said, no, nah, I've just wanted to just do the whole church thing, Jesus thing, Christian thing casually. I'm just an onlooker. I'm just passing by. I got to catch my flight in two hours. I don't know who you are. But I want you to take a few minutes and I want you to come up here and I want you to pray. And some of you maybe that have been going here for a long time and you've just been very casual in your your place here at Times Square Church. It's time to pick up the cross and carry it in this hour. Carry the cross. Now let's stand up and you come forward. Let's worship. Praise God. Come up. Come up. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for those who have come forward. I thank you for those here in the sanctuary, in the annex, those that are watching online, those in North Jersey. Lord, we say yes to your will. Lord, we come before you saying yes. We deny ourselves and we pick up the cross and we will carry it. And we know now, more than ever, because of your amazing grace, that if we lose our life, we will save it in you, Jesus Christ. So God, we surrender our self-will unto you, and we ask for your divine will. Forgive us, God, for making it about ourselves. Forgive us, God, for the times that we've tried to rebuke you because it's not going out on the way that we want it to go. Lord Jesus, have your way. We thank you for your word, the good news of your suffering, your rejection, your death, and your resurrection. 
And because of that, we have life. Lord, I truly believe here there are people that have come forward and today is the beginning of new life. It is the end of themselves and the beginning of new life in you, Jesus. And I thank you, God. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence here. This is your house, oh God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing a marvelous work. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.